Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and this week on the podcast, I have a very special guest. I have Megan Norcha. She is professor of English at SUNY Brockport, and she wrote a fascinating book called Gaming Empire in Children's British Board Games, 1836 to 1860. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Liz. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I'm so fascinated to have you on. So you study gaming board games from the 1800s how is that something that you stumble upon it must seem like a very strange specialty for a professor of english but i come by it honestly i'll tell you when i was a kid i think my two influences that started me on this road the two most formative things were not books at all but (laughs) were star wars and indiana jones and with Star Wars, it kind of begun began my fascination with Empire. I just became really interested with how a system, a centralized system, can try to exert its control over an entire galaxy, over all different kind of divergent peoples. And Indiana Jones, of course, you know, is a professor and also an expert in dusty archives and secrets of the past and you know my life has a little bit less swashbuckling than indiana's but i think those two influences empire and archives come together in this project and i got the idea for it in one of these great like serendipitous moments i was sitting in the baldwin library at the university of florida and i was doing research for my first book which was on these geography primers written by women like back in the 19th century and there was one of them barbara hofflin's panorama of geography a new game was the title and so i was doing a world cat search to find other editions of it to find out where they were because i was planning to go over to britain and um work in the british library a little bit so i was looking for these other editions and william spooner's game came up which i'm not even sure why it came up unless it was destiny but it was his board game about travelers through europe and it said in hard brackets board game in the metadata and i was like wow did they have board games back then and it turns out after about 15 years of research, I can say with the deepest confidence, yes, they did. And the board games were really fascinating in so many ways. The The further I went down that road, the more I saw that they were not just leisurely pastimes, but they helped to create this or foster this imperial ideology in the kids who played them. And so that became my focus, thinking about board games, because there's all kinds, it's such a big topic, right? But I wanted to think about the board games and their relationship with Empire, because that would unite my two interests, Archives and Empire. So that's how I got started. That is super interesting. So how can an innocent little kids game be a blueprint for future imperial thought? Well, there are so many. So I will just give one quick example. There's William Spooner, Uh, did this board game called Voyage of Discovery in 1836. And it's this beautiful game that has five ship tracks. And the ship tracks, how you would play is you would roll your teetotem and you would move your little ship along these five tracks. And the five tracks move through this unnamed island chain. It's unspecified where these islands are. And there are bubbles where you have to stop and you either take or you pay forfeits and you gather up, you know, this booty, this cash, right? And as you move through the different islands, and of course there are places where you might have to go backwards, places where you might be ejected from the game because your ship was caught in a storm at sea. And this is a game that probably interested me so much that it made me want to write about board games and empire because this game had spaces on it such as quote man killed by savages sailors burn huts pay too and so it made me think about the imperial economics of these kinds of moments right so it's very straightforward when you get to a space that says um 
you come upon natives panning for gold in a river, take two. And then you understand that in this very unequal imperial relationship, uh, the discoverer, the settler is trying to take from the indigenous person. And that's how they earn their wealth, right? And this establishes for child players what their relationship to indigenous peoples is going to be. But in other moments, such as the ones where sailors, players are enjoined to burn these huts, I think it opens up a chance for us as post-colonial players and thinkers and readers and doers to think about, well, let's say you did that. What about the old people? What about the babies? What about, you know, the fishing industry in this village? Is it going to be decimated if you burn their whole village? Is that the only option? And of course, on these board games, you don't have the element of choice, right? You follow a linear track. And so you don't have the agency to say, you know what? I'm not going to burn the village. I'm going to investigate why the man was killed. I'm going to investigate what happened here. You don't have that choice. You just have to take it for granted. And as a Victorian player, right? So as a contemporary person, that's a good place to start a conversation about the what if and the other than and the other kinds of alternatives. So I think it's important to consider those. And the games that you're studying, they come from what I understand from your book, they come at a kind of crucial period in how we understand children's relationships to games and the role that games can play in children's lives. Is this era the first time that games are truly being marketed to kids? Well, the games that I'm working on, the game industry really starts around 1750. Okay. And this is a really key moment. John Jeffries was the first one to do a game and he was geographer to the king, right? So these games that are playthings grew up in the same studios where pieces of cartography for adults were being produced. And his was a journey through Europe. And it was a pretty straightforward game. It was a map with a track embedded. And that was that. But this is also a critical moment, the mid 18th century, where children were becoming recognized as a marketing demographic. So before that, they were, you know, mostly seen as these imperfect versions of adults. They were smaller, but they would dress like adults and they weren't given their own special treatment their own special reading material. But after this period, publishers realized, well, hey, we can market to them. Uh, people like Newman began to market a little pretty pocket book, right? They began to create books just for kids, play things just for kids. And this continues through um, Francis uh, Burnett and the Little Lord Fauntleroy suit, where they began to market clothes just for kids. And Games and toys are part of that movement. The idea that there's a whole material culture organized around this demographic. And of course, there had been small ways, idiosyncratic examples of this, the Jane Johnson library that she did for her own children before the mid 18th century. But it's at this period that as a mass cultural event, this really starts to happen. And so we get mass production of these games. And the other big influence of this period certainly is, you know, the industrial revolution, the growth of the middle class. Finally, we have people in place who can afford these games and can afford to get them for their children. They're not just worrying about subsistence, right? Putting a roof over their head, making sure they have food at every meal. Um, they are actually able to think about leisure pursuits and they have the money and the time to do so. Does this sort of rise in board games directed to children and other things directed to children, the literature of this time, there's also adventure literature that starts to be aimed at kids. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Because that's part of this whole marketing demographic where we start to see the growth of literature written, especially for children. And you have the rise of publishers like the Religious Tract Society and the Society for the Promotion of Christian Knowledge. And what they would do is they would work with authors to produce books that would then be given as prize books in school for, you know, good attendance, for academic performance. And these books would contain very neat adventure plots. I mean, talk about a linear trajectory, right? Like we do with board games. They would have these very neat plots in which the child character would go out into the empire, out into the world, have an adventure, wrap it up, 
and then return back to the metropole with whatever he, usually always he at this early period, whatever he had learned or gained, and then establish heteronormative bonds and have a family and enrich the empire. So it was very much this trajectory about going out and coming back. And we see that in everything from, you know, the Coral Island to um, even Heart of Darkness at the end of the century, right? This idea that you go out and you come back. And Franco Moretti, Atlas of the European Novel, might be someone good to take a look at for this notion of literature and mapping, because he does a lot of work on that for London and Paris. So this idea of literature and mapping and going on an adventure and coming back, that's also mirrored in several of the games that you talk about in your book. Is that just a common theme among a lot of games at this time or just the ones you chose to study? I think it depends on the game. Some of the games are arranged, like I said, with um, with the Jeffries game, some of them are arranged as a piece of cartography. It looks like a map, and the only difference would be the embellishment around the outside or the track that's embedded across it, especially the early ones look like that. As we go on, that form is broken down and we have different ways in which the adventure is presented. Sometimes it's presented as a spiral, like Spooner's comic game of the Great Exhibition. Sometimes it's presented as a very neat enlightenment table, right? And that's um, for games about British sovereigns or well- Wellington's victories. Sometimes it's presented as There's one game by Harvey Darton that's presented inside the outline of an elephant. And they have representative scenes from Asia tucked inside this elephant. And so the gamers played with form. And we can think a lot about how form and the choice of form informs the kind of content in the game. What is it they were trying to say by choosing this form? Spooner when he did Comic Game of the Great Exhibition, chose this sort of spiral form. And it's almost dizzying because you have to keep turning the game if you want the illustrations embedded in the spiral to face you. And it's kind of nonsensical. And that fits the kind of content he has in the game. So that really works when you think about form and content. We usually talk about that in literature classes, right? So why did the poet choose to do a haiku or a villanelle or free verse? How does that fit what it is the poet is trying to do or to say or to communicate in the content? And the same is true of the games. They can either choose a very rigid orderly format in which to communicate things like royal succession, if it's about kings and queens, or they can choose a sort of dizzying spiral as Spooner does, if he's trying to mess with the idea of an exhibition and instead trying to make it a dizzy world where you don't really know where to look, which is often how it is if you're going to go to a big exhibit where there's lots of crowds and excitement. Fascinating. You mentioned that most of the adventure stories that are written at this time feature boys, but what do we know about the gender makeup of people who were playing the board games, the parlor games of this era? Were girls playing too? We don't know much. I mean, it's to be assumed that they were playing right along with their brothers. And research has shown that even the adventure narratives written very overtly and marketed for boys. I mean, they were the genre was boys adventure narratives. They didn't feature girls. They were not marketed to girls. Uh, I think Robert Louis Stevenson said uh, there was not a petticoat to be found in his Treasure Island, but girls read them. And some people thought it was safer, like Charlotte Young and uh, Mariah Edgeworth thought it was safer for girls to be able to read these kinds of adventures because they would know it was fiction and it would never be available to them. So that's something to be debated. That's definitely an area we could do more research on. Um, The only one I can think of explicitly off the top of my head is Rudyard Kipling wrote this story called Lispeth. L-I-S-P-E-T-H. And it's about a young woman who is Indian by birth and culturally English. She's raised by missionaries in India. And she is playing with this dissected map, which is, of course, a puzzle. And a lot of these board games were 
produced as board games, but then they were also chopped up and sold as puzzles as well. And she's playing with this board game and she happens upon an injured Englishman and falls in love with him and they have this affair. And then he leaves her because that was always his intention was to return home. He wasn't going to bring anything from the colonies back with him. He was going to return home and resume his life there. And she, of course, is heartbroken. And Kipling makes the point that at that moment where she's so heartbroken, she thinks of and goes back to this dissected map that she played as a child and I think that's really significant because what that shows us is that she's trying to puzzle together these aspects of her identity that don't seem to fit right being indigenous Indian but then also being culturally English and she doesn't fit in either world and Kipling himself had a little bit of that, right? I mean, he was English, but he grew up in India and then returned to India later um, as a young man and really loved the culture, but he was part of the ruling sahibs. And so to reconcile that, I think, was probably very difficult. That is really interesting. So were jigsaw puzzles also a big thing at this time? Yes. Um, if you're interested, Linda Hannis probably is the authority on that. She has a great series of books on the puzzles from this period. And they were, I work mostly with the dissected maps because of my interest in empire, but pretty much there were lots of pictures. UCLA has a great collection of ones that look like Robinson Crusoe. And what they would do is they would use um, a knife and they would cut these pictures and then you would slide them together. They weren't interlocking. We didn't have that kind of technology until much later, um, at least the 20th century, but they would be pictures that you could put together. And it's worth thinking about how kids would have put a map together. And what that helps us to consider is how much gaming is a social activity. Right. It's almost a live performance. And we have these artifacts. Probably Linda Hannes estimates that maybe 30 to 40 percent of games and puzzles from the period have survived. And I mean, this is because kids play with things. They're not gentle users. Right. I mean, they play with things until they're tattered and in pieces and all over the house and, you know, under the couch and everywhere. So imagine the frustration for archivists trying to reconstruct the way these games were played, trying to you know, see all the pieces, trying to understand that. And, you know, so we're trying to do that. But at the same time, you cannot reproduce what it must have been like to play this game in community with others, what was discussed above the board, how did they understand these places, what was in the news about India while they were playing this game, what was happening in Jamaica while they were playing this game, right? I mean, how did they bring that knowledge to the way they played and experienced? And Robin Bernstein has a book called Racial Innocence, in which she talks about toys giving us scripts, you know, so we're almost as children, as players, given a doll or a toy soldier, and it has a script. And we have to play with it accordingly. But of course, kids improvise, right? They don't play necessarily always by the script. And I think probably we have to assume that the same happened with board games. Not just boys played them. And they may not have played them by the rules. We just don't know. We only have a few, you know, diary accounts or journal accounts or recollections of adults later after the fact. So some of these kids might have been the ones who, you know, neatly decorated the dream house and others were the ones who kind of ripped the head off the Barbie, so to speak. <laughs> right. I mean, the point is that, you know, they absorbed this ideology. They absorbed these imperial scripts and what they went and did with them, we don't really know. But there are, of course, outstanding examples from the period, right? We know that the Bronte children and, um, you know, Charlotte Bronte, who went on to write Jane Eyre and her very gifted sisters also were writers. We know that they were given, well, their brother was given toy soldiers um, by their father one Christmas and they all played with the toy soldiers. They divided them up. They got to name, each got to name the toy soldier and choose 
a realm of the world that they wanted their toy soldier to be the leader of. So they essentially parsed up the world and uh, put their toy soldiers in charge of them. And then they played these games, which were so absorbing that they began to write them down. And they survived, this juvenilia survives as the Glass Town Chronicles and the Angria Chronicles. And it produced these hundreds of pages. And that got them ready. It primed the pump for these amazing British novels they would go on to write as adults. Now, not every kid, of course, was a Bronte, but if it could do that for them, playing with these toys, these material culture objects that have their embedded scripts, what could it do for a regular kid who might go on to be a missionary, who might go on to be a teacher in India, or who might go on to be a soldier in Jamaica, or who might experience the empire and be a merchant very nearby in Ireland, or in Canada, be a fur trader, right? I mean, there's all of these disparate roles that an imperialist could play. And in some ways, the toys and board games get them ready for that. One thing I thought was very interesting that came up in your book is that, you know, when you think of empire, you think of the colonies, But these games also were giving British children a blueprint for understanding the nascent United States and their different ideological positions. Would you be willing to talk to them about that? Absolutely. And I think the best game to talk about with that, and you can Google any of these games. Some of them are in archives. Some of them have online um, presences. I've even found some of them on Pinterest. Very shocking. And that just shows how much the world of archival scholarship and digital scholarship has changed over the last 15 years since I began this process. But there's one, it's by Edward Wallace, and he was part of the Wallace dynasty of game publishers. His father, John, was very prolific uh, back to the 18th century. But around 1844, Edward Wallace publishes The Star Spangled Banner, Game of Emigrants to the United States. Though it is doubtful that anyone would emigrate to the United States after playing this game, because it's just sort of this wonderful, grudging, curmudgeonly game about how miserable it is to live in the United States in this howling wilderness. And it's contrasted beautifully to Canada, this glowing beacon controlled by Britain, of course, to the north. So because the United States had sort of thrown off um, British colonial rule, it is represented very negatively in the game. Uh, Wallace even says at one point that settlers lead a dissolute and miserable life on the frontier. And, you know, they're given to drinking and they're preyed upon by all these animals. I think I counted like there's 27% of the sites on the game have to do with predatory animals. (laughs) So, I mean, if you think about the United States as a whole, surely there's more to say. There's Niagara Falls after all, right? There's all these other interesting bits about it, but the game really focuses on these sharks and wolverines and grizzlies and animals that drink blood and vampire rays and alligators and snakes that are represented as being as big as a house. And, 19% of the game focuses on cities, but a third of those cities are in Canada. So it's supposed to be about the United States, but actually it's about contrasting the United States and the dissolution that is happening there and the danger, ferocity, violence, predation with the cool beacon of Canada to the north. And my theory about this is, and it's represented in the game, is that what Wallace was trying to show in 1844 was the negative result of the practice of trafficking in human beings, of enslaving human beings. Because in the United States, we had another at least 20 years until the Emancipation Proclamation, whereas Britain, by this point, for like some 30 years, had already abolished uh, slavery in its colonies and outlawed the slave trade. And so they really were on a moral high ground here with this issue. And so not only did America represent a former colony that had made another choice, but they were also morally bankrupt in pursuing this traffic of human beings. And so they could be contrasted with Canada. And some visible ways to do that is to show this dog-eat-dog, predatory, ferocious animal culture and 
also to show us that the cities are, quote, inferior and not well planned. And this connects to also, of course, the culture that they're seeing or the lack of culture that they're seeing in the country. Let us just meditate, by the way, on the fact that the British Empire, or at least some of its game designers, wanted to crow moral victory about just abolishing slavery earlier without shame that they had been trafficking in human lives for God knows how long before that. That is a, that is a very precious little moral position right there. (laughs) (laughs) And it's fascinating, you know, I mean, there's this other game by the Ogilvy's Columbia land of the West, and that's about the United States as well. And that one shows 1619 and the introduction of slavery into the Americas. And what it does is lay the blame for the disarray in America on the part of the European settlers and the European powers who divided it up and tried to colonize it, the French, the Dutch, the Spanish, the English. And it says that having so many cooks like that, having so many parties warring over it, creates this kind of confusion and this vacuum in which immoral practices like trafficking in humans and enslaving humans takes place. And that can be contrasted to the orderly way uh, in which a a place like Canada is settled, right? And so there, that contrast kind of develops there. Even though there is this culpability, it's placed in the distant past. And it's like, well, you know, we might've done that once, but now, of course, we don't do that, unlike these other people. And the contrast between England and its imperial rivals is really important if you're building up a presentation of self and your building a portrait of empire that you want to be attractive, that you want children to embrace and become stewards of. And I mean, it's important to think about, you know, this is a period where not a generation before we had seen Napoleon rise to power. And that French empire was not good news for the British. And so the word empire or emperor could have very negative connotations associated with him. And they certainly didn't want that. But by mid-century, by the mid-1900s, empire had taken on another resonance as this collective uh, enterprise in which England's benevolent guidance could help all of these countries to be their best selves, meaning closer to England, right? With a version of English law, English manners and customs, and English religious beliefs, and learning to read and write the English language and education and cultural practices, and all of that. So, while I think to some degree, looking back, um, it's it's horrifying and sort of fascinating, we also have to keep in mind that there is some nuancing that can be done uh, in terms of why people would have participated in this empire and what they thought they were doing. Some of them had a much more benevolent view and didn't realize, as we do now in the post-colonial period, that imperialism was going to cast a long shadow and that it was going to disenfranchise people. So basically, these young British children were growing up with just this constant input of, you know, this is an orderly, beautiful place we have here, and we export our lovely, beautiful culture everywhere else. And, you know, this is the real hub of good things, but other places are good for going off to have adventures or make money, and then you come back. Yes, exactly, right? You go for those products that are there. And then you come back and bring them back to enrich the empire. Those are our sandboxes. Those are our playgrounds. And Henry Smith Evans in his Crystal Palace board game actually goes so far as to write across the map. It's a map board game. And he writes across the body of the continent of Africa the names of the commodities that can be harvested from Africa. So things like wood, palm oil, ivory – And these things are never written across European countries. So it's to show that these other places elsewhere in the world, non-European places, are meant for harvest. And there's sort of this reconnaissance move where child players can identify what they can take, what they can get from these areas. And it's presenting the world in that way, 
would give a player the idea that the world is there for us. It's there for our taking. But of course, you know, as Roger Kipling said famously later in the century, it's the white man's burden. It's something we're doing out of disinterest. We're doing it because we're bringing these virtues of British law and religion and education. We're not doing it to be greedy. We're not doing it to get rich. And maybe that was true of of some of the people who were involved in civil service and missionary and teaching work, but certainly not all and certainly not only. Yeah, I mean, that just sounds like a very spurious argument to modern (laughs) ears. And that's a good thing. You know, we've changed so much. So I have a question, though. So What's, one thing that's really interesting is that the values that these games are teaching, I wonder, are they, how conscious are they? Are they something that is deliberately being done to educate children? Or are people just perpetuating assumptions that they already made and just naturally passing them down from generation to generation? Well, I think an example might be, I was talking about the Star Spangled banner game a little bit before and about how it represented slavery and human trafficking as part of the problem with the United States. You know, it was sort of the reason why the United States was not like Canada, was not, was in fact morally bankrupt and there were all these problems and it was a terrible, dissolute place to live. And that's represented in the way the game is played. So for example, the game has what I call these knowledge loops where you land on a certain spot and you're made to go backwards or you land on one spot, you're made to go backwards and then that spot sends you backwards again. And these spots, I track them through the game. These spots where you're made to go backwards are spots in Virginia, a slave market in Kentucky, the site of a lynching of an African uh, slave, you know? And so this is important because the way the game is played it, it's designed to get you to stop at these moments and then return to an earlier spot. So in effect, you are going backwards, just like the United States is going backwards and not advancing in a straight linear line towards progress. And the Victorians were all about progress, right? Going up the mountain. And instead, in these moments that are morally questionable, you're made to go backwards and your success in the game is jeopardized because of the unsuccessful things that people in America were doing. And that's one of the things the games try to accomplish is to yoke your personal success to the success of the empire. And in this case, because we're talking about the United States, you go backwards because they're doing backwards things. And there's even a spot where you land in, um, I think it's Mississippi. I'm trying to remember. You land on this rice plantation and the game abjures you to miss two turns to inquire into the condition of the slaves on the plantation. And I think it's meant to be a little punitive, but it's also meant to tell the player, to enjoin the player, this is your responsibility, that this is happening in the world and you're a British citizen and part of your job is to eradicate these practices and to be a beacon of difference and to be different than this, right? And the British weren't only interested in differentiating themselves from the Americas, but also from Spain and of course from the French and the Dutch and basically anyone else who was a rival in these ways. So they were very conscious that they didn't want to have the empire of Napoleon and that they wanted to be part of this white man's burden. And I think the games try to inculcate it even in these very subtle ways about how you're meant to go backwards and forwards and pause in the game. You know, it's not just about the visuals on the game board, but it's also about the way you play the how in the game, as well as the what. What's fascinating to me though, is that this is the same era as that Spooner game that you were talking about where people go on these journeys and it's like, Ooh, locals are painting for gold take two and so you can have this huge epic argument about why your empire is so superior and then you can write that for fun copy and expect the kid to be like yeah and they probably think that they're just on a fun adventure and honestly the person who wrote it might have just thought that that was fun flavor text for all we know 
<laughs> yeah, and I mean, it's it's hard to say because these are written by different game publishers, just like adventure novels, right? They're written by different authors at different moments in their career. And, you know, at the start of his career, Spooner produces something like Voyage of Discovery, which is all about take or pay economics and acquiring whatever you can at the expense of indigenous peoples, but then very late in his career, he does this comic game of the great exhibition, which uses caricatures by George Cruikshank, who was a fabulous cartoonist from the era, really sarcastic, wonderful, satirical work. And in the comic game, he's really questioning England nation exhibition, what it means to ideologically perform and, promote a vision of your country. So by the end of his career, he might be saying something a little bit different. And I think probably there were market forces at work, right? I mean, the interesting thing about children's literature and children's playthings is that they're not bought by children because of course children don't usually have the means. They're bought by adults. And at this period, we have the rise of the middle class. You know, we have like 80% of the population practically is working class. They can't afford these games. We've got no fun in games for kids who are waking up at 5 a.m. to go work in the factory and stay there till 8 o'clock at night. Uh, it wasn't until the 1840s that we really see some regulation of child labor. And so these are different kinds of children. These are children who are being groomed to go out and be civil servants in empire, to go out and be missionaries and ministers and soldiers and have these kind of merchants and earn money and buy these big houses and maybe even <gasps> marry into the aristocracy. And so this whole class of people needs to get up to speed. And so these games were seen as objects that grew out of this enlightenment impulse to learn, to satisfy curiosity, and to prepare to be ready for this destiny that they saw dawning on the horizon for them. So this also leads to the question, since we are modern people, uh, you can look back at games in this era and see what they deliberately or maybe not as deliberately said about the time in which they were made. What do our games now say about us? Oh, that's such an interesting question. I mean, I think that games, well, that's one of the things I asked my students, you know, because I've been fascinated by this for probably 15 years. And it's one of the things I ask them is what do these games that we love teach us? And how do they train us to think? And I had one student once at the University of Florida who just gave the best reading of Hungry Hungry Hippos. Do you remember that game with the paddles that you hit and then it gobbles oh, up the marbles? Yeah. Yeah, it was so much fun. And I mean, it's, you know, a ridiculous game. You can only play it like once or twice. And you're like, all right, I'm done. But she had said that that game was capitalism. And I just thought that was such a profound thing to say, because it's about gobbling and acquiring as much as you can. And of course, whatever you can gobble is less that someone else can gobble. So even the way we play our games competition versus collaboration is an important choice and may link up to these different economic, um, social, national systems. I mean, games are still important just because we don't recognize the way that they're teaching and training us. With the Victorians, it's easy to see because we have the distance of 100 years, 200 years. But with these games that we're playing now, we have to look and slow down and think about what we could be learning, what these games could be training us to do. And we see agencies like um, the United Nations, the Potsdam Climate Institute, um, Marin County. We see all of these agencies trying to use games in a productive, recuperative, reparative way. So um, the UN, for example, has this road to peace game that they used with kids in Afghanistan. They gave the game out and it was supposed to teach kids about the peace process and about rebuilding and, um, you know, making the world safe. And the Potsdam Institute for Climate Change did a game called Keep Cool. And Marin County in California did this game of floods. And what both of those were designed to do is to get kids thinking about climate change and what they could do collaboratively to work against climate change, to prepare for it, to occupy the subject position of islanders who were suddenly being inundated by floods that were caused by climate change. And what can we do together to make it better? And 
this comes back, I think, to an old example. I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, there was this game theorist, Garrett um, Hardin. And in 1968, he comes up with this story called The Tragedy of the Commons. And it's a great story about how we play and this whole idea of competitive versus collaborative. So he says, imagine that you have a herd of cows or sheep or whatever you like. And, you know, everybody else in your village has herds too. And there's this common land and y'all bring your herds there and they all graze together in the twilight. And it's lovely. And then one day your neighbor adds another animal to his herd and you all see it. And maybe you're talking about it or maybe you're thinking, what is he doing? Adding another animal. And so then the next day, somebody else adds another animal. And so then you're like, whoa, two people have added other animals. I better add another animal to mine. And so what happens is more and more people add animals, the commons get overgrazed and they're destroyed. And so we all lose. And he said that the reason we all lose is because we think of ourselves as playing competitively instead of collaboratively. And that if we Hmm. think about ourselves as a community, we're going to play a different game than if we think of ourselves as competitors who are out to get the resources and it's, you know, a competition between us to see who can get more and who can achieve more individual wealth, a bigger herd. So games, the way they're structured, prepare us for that kind of competitive world. And it would just be interesting to see more games that were collaborative and to think about the kind of world that they would prepare us to inhabit and the kinds of problems they would inform us to solve. It's actually very funny that you should say that since this era has really seen in in modern hobby gaming, the rise of cooperative games. There's so many now. You know, you have Pandemic, you have you know, cooperative deck builders like Aeon's End. And actually the number one problem that emerges from cooperative games now is what's called the alpha player problem, where mm-hmm. one person will try to quarterback for everyone else because they think they know how to win. So they direct <laughs> everybody's moves and then everybody else gets mad. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I mean, that might've come from, uh, you know, a book like Ender's Game, right? Where he doesn't know he's playing a game, but he is, and he's the hot shot. He's like sort of the, the lead dog there. And so, I mean, I think that's another example of what how games are actually training material. But that's interesting that that could be designed to promote collaboration, but then the way it's played subverts that script. I mean, again, you know, these games are co-authored they're partly by the publisher but then they're authored in part by the people who play them because you're determining something in the way that you choose to play whether you follow the rules whether you make your own rules whether you add side rules the game changes that is absolutely true i want to thank you so much by the way for the time that you have put into this podcast with me uh if anybody would like to reach you with questions what is the best way to get in touch I have an email at Brockport. It's M-N-O-R-C-I-A at Brockport.edu. And you can just search me up at SUNY Brockport and uh, find me that way. That was Megan Norcha, everybody. And you can find me anywhere as Beyond Solitaire. Thank you so much for listening and happy gaming.